The movement's back in the clock and it's been running. I have replaced my variable power supply with a uh, voltage adjusted fixed one just for uh, simplifying the matter a little bit. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to see how much power this actually draws so that when I order the permanent adapter, I know what to get. So I dug out my logging multimeter and I've let this run for a while. I've, I will post a graph of a minute's worth of current use so that you can see what that is. But this um, has been helpful to see just how much power the clock draws and in what circumstance. And so it draws the most when it's firing all four bell relays. And it seems like uh, as long as I can get about 200 milliamps at 24 volts, I'll, I will be pretty good. Some notes. Um, I had this running reasonably reliably at about 18 volts in the past. And after cleaning, the winding solenoid here seems to need a little bit more power than that. And I'm not exactly sure why. I played with the position of this a little bit relative to the, um, the uh, steel plate that it pulls on. And I, I do think this is a 24-volt nominal clock, so I'm, I don't think it's out of spec, but I am a little confused as to why it takes a little bit more power than it once did to reliably fire this. So let's talk about some adjustments. So you can see the contact coming up right here. There it went. That is the um, slave clock relay. So how do you get this, after you take the movement apart and clean it all up, how do you get it back in the right place? Well, there is quite a bit of adjustability here. These rocker arms can be, uh, you can loosen the screws and slide them on the shaft, which brings the, the finger in farther um, if necessary. And then these contacts actually are adjustable. The, the rotary contacts that the, those uh, wipers hit are on collars with screws. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are getting good solid contact, but you only want it for one touch. Um, otherwise, your slave clocks will advance two minutes every minute, or you will wind the clock two minutes worth of power every minute, and neither of those are good things. So here we go again you can see that the wiper passes under the contact, it hits the contact, and then it passes over the contact. And you can see the screw that's coming up about 12 o'clock right now. Uh, I ended up having to adjust that slightly just due to um, maybe a little different position in the gear train than, than it originally was. Um, so that's an adjustment that was very helpful. Um, I mentioned that I did adjust the position of this solenoid. The other thing that I spent some time trying to get working right are the um, the ring duration contacts. That's that's these guys here. In my clock, for some reason, one of them is longer than the other. It's hard to get in there and see it, but this one in the front is slightly longer than the one in the back. And as it makes contact with the pins, you can sort of adjust the the length of duration of the ring by how far in or out those contacts are. In my particular case, um, it appears that the rear contact, you can see it's riding on the pin right now. That one released. And then that one released. The, the rear ones seem to be running bell relays uh, two, three, and four, and the front one seems to be running number one. So I'm not sure if this was an intentional decision about how they wanted this particular clock to run, but I did spend some time trying to get that uh, where I wanted it to go. Uh, other than that, the clock has been running great. So ahead, I still need to go through this uh, apparatus, try to get this cleaned up and re-oiled. Um, but other than that, I think we're pretty much where we need to be with the movement. Uh, it's got great amplitude. I've been watching it, and it's winding the right amount. Uh, that's other, actually one other note I wanted to mention. Um, you don't want this winding more than one tooth per minute, or you will end up having to put a lot of force on the mechanism. It's it's supposed to be a, you know a balanced process where a clock runs for one minute, then it winds for one minute. And so there is this pin down there right above the solenoid. And that sets the resting position 
of the lifting cam here, this guy. And you want to watch this so that when the solenoid pulls it, it only ratchets the tooth one tooth. If it falls too far, it's possible that the solenoid might be able to push that two teeth, which would not be good. So you can bend that a tiny bit if you need to, to get that where you need it to be. Uh, other installation notes, you just need to make sure that you're getting contact where you want it and not where you don't. And so uh, I, wanted to make sure that I was getting the, the contact where it's supposed to be. It comes in through the back of the movement here. And then this is the contact that's actually attached to the clock plate. It's a little wiper that, um, that provides power to the escape wheel arbor there. Other than that, nothing should have continuity. So if you use your digital multimeter, you can tell where um, things are connected to each other. And if you measure these places, these are insulated places. All of these should not have continuity with the clock frame. One other note, my particular clock was wired in this way and I put it back there. The one in the front is the slave clock and the one in the back is the winding mechanism. Um, I don't know if that's standard or not, it just happens to be the way that it was on this clock. Um, if I would, were to have reversed these wires, everything would work the same, except instead of this being the clock pulse, the one in the front would have been the winding pulse, and the one in the rear would have been the clock pulse. I don't think it makes any difference, but that's just another note. In a conventional clock, the wear items are usually things that rotate, like our pivots here. And in this clock, I did put some bushings in to take some of that wear out. But in an electric clock like this, there's another wear point, and that is the electrical contacts. If you look at the wiper coming up at about 11 o'clock right now, you can see a little pit where repeated arcing has actually blasted the metal away. Um, I'm not sure what these contacts are. I think they're, they're very possibly silver. I have another clock that's silver, and that seems to be a metal that stands up well to arcing, but there is some wear here. And so you can probably adjust the position of where those contacts hit and get more life out of your contacts if you need to. The wipers can be adjusted in or out by just sliding their position on the verge. Um, and actually these wipers as well can be moved around with the screw collars. And so you can probably get them so that they make contact in slightly a different place than they used to. The other thing that I mentioned earlier was the uh, new way of, of dissipating the current that is released when the circuit is broken. So these electromagnetic solenoids, when you put power in them, they produce a magnetic field, which does a job, you know, pulling on the, um, the relay or the, the winding solenoid in this case. And that energy, when you're done using it, it doesn't just go away, it has to be released. And so all of that magnetic field that you created with uh, the electrical impulse collapses and turns back into electricity and actually creates a little spark. So in this clock, the way that they've mitigated that are these cylinders. These are resistors. This one says 4,500 on it. There's one down here that says 2,600. And what that does is that provides a place for the current to go. And that does seem to help quite a bit uh, I'm not sure where they got these values from or why they are different, but that um, draws a little extra power when you're firing the solenoid, but it also isn't just a, um, you know, an open circuit when you release it. So this clock does have some mitigation. Um, the modern way to do this would be actually to use a diode. A diode is an electrical device that conducts current only in one direction. And so you can attach this in the same manner that these resistors are here where uh, when you're applying power to the solenoid, then the power does not flow through the diode and only flows into the coil. But when the coil releases, then the power flows in the other direction and then the diode actually shorts that out and uh, eliminates that, um, that extra arcing. Anyway, I think we're pretty well back to spec here. So just a little bit more to do on the timekeeping side of this, and then we'll look at the mechanism for the bell tape.